So, um, uh, as I started with uh, the lower division courses, basically introductory physics one, uh, I had one of the students actually in this course uh, helping me as a TA. And so the TAs would help me uh, grade the stack of 100, 120 or so exams. I actually had two uh, TAs, but this was one of the TAs that happened to be a physics major. And uh, she said, well, why are these rubrics just for you? Why don't you give these rubrics to the students as well? So they know what they did. And I'm like, that's genius. Thank you very much. So then the rubric sort of morphed into something uh, a little bit like this page here. I, I guess people can see this. Um, but this was actually a page that I built here in Excel. I just print this out. Every student got one of these pages. And regardless of who was doing the, the TA work, uh, we'd sit there and mark off what students got what right, what students got what wrong. Um, and the students would actually have this page in their exam if they came and got it, or, or once the exams were uh, given back to the students. So going from a rubric that I saw to a rubric that the students got to see, I thought was a really nice change. But then it came to my development of the online course, and I said, you know, I still have these problems where I don't want to give multiple choice or at least not multiple choice only exams. I'd still like to have some problems where students actually work out the details and um, I can tell them what they're doing right and I can tell them what they're doing wrong. I can give them partial credit if need be. And I think this is a, a nice way to, to teach, particularly in a, a physics course. How do you make a a, a better student if they don't know what they were doing right and what they were doing wrong. So then it sort of morphed into still a different kind of uh, rubric. <laughs> this is obviously a little bit more complicated still. And uh, let's see if I can get this out of the way. And this is basically something that I encoded into Blackboard. Now this is an incredible rubric. So this is for different problems, but uh, I got a a little bit of notoriety over in the center of e-learning for my rather elaborate rubrics. And it's, it's built down to fractions of a point, maybe not completely ideal, but it kind of tells you a little bit about the evolution from a, a personal rubric to a rubric that students can see to trying to figure out how to replicate uh, a handwritten face-to-face -face exam in an online environment. And that kind of brings us to today. Let me stop sharing. M is actually built into two different modules. So in order to make sure that students know how to do the required skills and all of their hardware is going to work and there aren't any surprises about what I expect on the exams, the exam is deployed through a, a preparation module and they have to complete various steps in the preparation module to be able to open the actual exam. Now, today is not about what the preparation is like and how to deploy the exam. The, today is really about, well, what might a partial credit problem look like in an exam and how would you go about grading it? I think those are relevant questions. So this particular exam, I've taken a, an ex actual exam that I gave uh, earlier this year and uh, put it into a, a dummy shell just so we can look at it. And this is essentially what one of my exams looks like. There's some partial credit. I'm going through this very fast because this isn't where I'm going to end up. There's a little bit of short answer completion. But I'm wanting to highlight there are certain problems where I'm allowing the students to work out multiple steps in multiple different ways, much like they did in their homework, much like they saw as examples in the course materials, and I'm asking them to replicate it. Uh, this is one of the problems. This is still a, a, another one. And this was the final question. This is one that I'd like to spend a little bit more time with. There's a, a number of different things that a student has to do with a question like this. And so uh, after the exam is over, I let everybody see how to do the problem and, and how me as a professor uh, expects them to do the problem. And in this particular case, uh, there's some equations that they're supposed to develop and solve. And finally, there's another little step where they can take the results from the previous section, put them into another section, and get a final result. So uh, an expert might approach a problem this way, 
come up with their uh, relevant numbers and things would be great. What I'd like to highlight here is maybe as we as I start grading it as a person, I really expect them to start from a certain stage. And this is a stage where they saw this in the lecture already. They saw this in previous quizzes and, and other assignments such as homework earlier in the term. They've gotten feedback on how to do this. And if they didn't do it right, some things that they might do to help themselves. So now this is representative of a response that I might have gotten in an exam. First of all, I would like to take that previous problem and, and notice here I had a couple of things as far as the solution that everybody got to see. Uh, there's the development of these different equations. These are called kinematic equations, and then they get solved in a particular way to get a particular result. Down here, you see there's some conservation of energy. So you'll see this in my rubric. It's, it's all built into the different steps. So now, uh, looking at my rubric, I actually expect them to know about kinematic equations. You know, do you know how to put various components into that equation? Do you know how to build this equation? And maybe you don't know how to do all of it, but you can give me some sense of what's going on. Uh, there are two equations, one of them for y and one of them for x. And so I have the very similar rubric results for each of those things. Uh, then I ask you to solve this system of equations. Uh, then do you actually get the number associated with the, the number that I gave you? Do you know what units of this particular quantity is supposed to be? Do you know how to put those results? Now into a second part of the problem. Notice here this is B, where this is the end of part A. So did you know you were supposed to use a certain technique? Did you know various parts of that technique? Did you know how to put all of those parts together? Did you know how to finally get a particular answer? So this is how I go about grading it. It's not quite the fine-grained detail that I might have had recently on face-to-face -face exams, but it's, it's representative of things that I expect them to know how to do, and I give them places where they can get partial credit. So the students are actually able to submit a PDF as part of the exam, and this might be representative of what a student might have submitted um, for the problem that I just talked about. Um, on that actual exam, this was actually a representative default student, what they might have uh, responded to. Only it's in my handwriting, so it's, it's really not uh, giving any students other kinds of problems. So that being said, if I was to grade a problem like this, what I see is a student did not do any of the developmental stages. They just sort of jumped to a final answer that they might have remembered from the notes. Whether they remembered it correctly or incorrectly, you know, it turns out they remembered it correctly, but they didn't really start where I asked them to, even in previous uh, settings. So I might say that they didn't really know how to de develop kinematic equations. They didn't do all the necessary steps. Uh, to get to the place where they did, they had to do some things right or remember it right at one time or another. So I might have given some partial credit for this part. Uh, for the X problem, it was very representative of the same, but they really didn't do any work. I'm being generous, if anything else. Uh, they didn't really solve the system of equations, uh, and they, they just remembered something from the notes. So they, they might have did some manipulation mathematically, but they didn't really do a lot of work. But it turns out they did get the correct answer, and they did actually put units. And once they got this result, they knew to, to step into another part of the problem. Uh, from the rubric, you might remember, I asked them to use conservation of energy. So they knew they needed to use that. There's a couple of parts that uh, I recognize as an expert they needed. So there were springs. They knew about kinetic energy, but they didn't know about one of the important parts. And they essentially, they tried to uh, get this kinetic energy, the conservation of energy correct, but they didn't quite do it because they were missing one of the parts. They knew how to solve for the correct thing. Uh, they didn't get the right value, but they would have gotten the right value probably had they remembered one of the parts, and they did get the right units. So I get down to the end, and this student essentially got 14 of the 13 points available. There's a lot of extra credit built into this problem. Now, not only through the rubric can I tell students what they did correctly and what they did incorrectly, uh, I can actually do inline markup inside the speed grader. So I might say here, um, 
this was an equation memorized from the notes. I expected you to develop this equation. And similarly down here, uh, actually this is not the correct place. Energy from the spring raises the mass and gives it velocity. You are missing a term. So students get to see this inline feedback. They can get some direction for where things were going on. Uh, gravitational potential energy would go here. So there's lots of different kinds of markups that I could do. I can actually make uh, marks and, and circle things and, and give some sort of a feedback. I don't want the highlighter, I want the pen. So I can actually circle things or do whatever needs to be done, give some further feedback. But this is kind of how I go about doing the, the grading. So now another question you might have for yourself. OK, I see this evolution from face to face courses to online courses. I see this evolution in rubrics. And now you've shown me a whole bunch of this stuff that may be applicable to a technical course. But how would that necessarily apply to me? And the reason why I might encourage people to consider a grading mechanism like this, even for a course that's in you know, history or political science or biology, or you can go right down through the list is because this sort of technique has really ended up saving me a lot of time. When I first uh, started teaching even upper division classes, but let's, let's keep it to a class that's very representative of like this. Uh, the face-to-face -face version of this class has about 120 or so students per semester. And I like to have three of these problems on each of the exams. So when I got started with the face-to-face -face version of this sort of a course, 120 students, three problems per student, uh, this was the kind of thing where me and two TAs would sit for the better part of an entire day to grade an exam. So then I got a little bit smarter. Uh, this student was really helpful and said, well, why don't you put all the rubrics in each of the individual exams? So then I started making less notes on the exams, more notes on the rubric, and grading actually went faster. Me and two TAs could then grade uh, basically a whole exam in a morning. So maybe uh, something like four to five hours. Well, now as time has evolved and using these speed grader tools inside of Canvas, I can now in a class of about 70 grade three of these problems by myself with no TAs at about something like an hour and a half per problem. This ends up being about five five minutes or so, probably less than that, uh, per student, per uh, question. So I can basically grade an exam by myself in a morning using the exact same sort of techniques. And it's archival. I don't have to send the exam back to the students. And they really get a lot of feedback for how to do the problem. So this talks a little bit about my evolution. Uh, now I've talked for a long time. I kind of want to hear what everybody else might have to say. So. With that, I guess I can uh, pass back to Lisa and uh, see if, if anybody's still following along. Yeah. Well, that was a lot. Thank you. Thank you. And um, so we have a lot that um, Dr. Sorge has shared with us to consider, right? Um, and what I would like for us to do, folks, um, is engage each other in a conversation about our perspective and our analysis of the success that Dr. Sorge has, has shown us, has described, has explained his process, and think a little bit about how we can replicate a part of what he shared. And he's gonna sit back a little bit and he's gonna listen to our conversation. And in a few moments, um, once we've analyzed his success together as a community of practice, we're going to invite him to come back in and then share his 
continued thoughts about what he does and the success he's experienced and now what we've talked about. So with that being said, um, I'd like to just open up the conversation. We can start by just sharing perspective. Um, I'd like us to hold our questions for a moment because that's what Dr. Sorge is gonna be doing. He's gonna be, if we ask, if, if we have a question, let's say folks, <laughs> thank you. It, uh, if we have a question, let's ask it of the group. Dr. Sorge is going to be listening, and he's going to be able to answer that when he comes back in. So I'm wondering if anyone would like to start. Like, what did you, what did you hear? What was successful? Why was it, why was it successful? And I can how can in. you replicate that? Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I am impressed with the uh, the capability of building in the scaffolding because we know how key that is. To, uh, to having our students develop, building in the scaffolding, but also building it in in a way that the, that the students are a part of it. And, and if, they are, if they haven't reached the level, you know, the one level, he has it set up in such a way that, that he can tell immediately and give them the feedback on it. And, uh, and that's a pretty impressive tool and a pretty impressive uh, learning opportunity for the students. What else did we hear that was successful to us? And why do we think that was successful? It looks like we have, do we have a hand raised, Ashley? Yeah, you might be able to unmute them as well as presenters. So. They're unmuted. Thank you. Go ahead. Sushma? Yeah from uh, Devi campus. Uh, I think students would appreciate the transparency where they could see how everything was allotted and if they didn't do it, they, it's like, you know, for, for them, uh, many times they don't have to even see the instructor. They would just see the, the transparency in their grading. And I think students would appreciate a lot of uh, that because they don't want any, um, they want to know the reason why they lost points. The transparency works, I think, in this case. Hmm. What else did we hear that was that we, what you believe is successful and what does that mean to us? What does it look like? I can't uh, tell when anyone else is jumping in and I apologize if I'm jumping in on someone. Um, to me, the, uh, the, the uh, degrees of, of uh, information available in the rubric are really incredible and I'm looking forward to taking a closer look at those rubrics myself and see how how they can be adapted in various ways. Thank you. And I'll actually um, I'd like to add a little bit um, uh, from my own perspective. I'm I'm really interested in the formative aspect of all of this. And when Dr. Sorge was talking about the fact that the students have already seen parts of the problem and they're receiving his feedback for the course regarding the problem so that they can then turn around and reapply this new information. Um, I, I, in, in, in my classroom, I would find that successful. I'd be able to, I would be able to replicate that in my classroom. Um, and I, I also like um, and understand how putting the feedback right on the document for the students can also be very successful. It sort of goes back to uh, the, you know, the traditional, the face-to-face -face where the teacher will, would put the feedback right on the the assignment, and then the student takes it and reads it and applies it and, and, and so on and so on. So I find that, from from my perspective, I find that very interesting and I'd like to use that in my classroom. Someone else? Uh, I'll talk it again. Your comment about the, uh, having seen pieces of it before and then applying, to me, uh, what, what that rang a bell in my mind that uh, of more of a real-world application of here's, here's what's going on 
here's what we did when it worked, and here's how we can uh, apply it now. You need like a piece of it, whether it's physics or whatever. Mm -hmm. Can you repeat yourself, uh, Dr. Judy? You you have um, uh, your your connection's a little uh, strained. Can you just repeat that last part? Um, it, yeah, I'm doing this from my phone, yeah. so I, I have no idea how how it's coming through. But I'm pleased about that I'm able to join in. Um, the fact that we choose the components of it that we use one here and then use that in the next part to me has the impact of a, of a real world situation. Mm -hmm. so the students into where they, you know, where they will actually do something that they have already encountered and apply it to a new, a new situation. So transfer of knowledge and uh, and critical thinking. Thank you. The transfer of knowledge piece. That's what I was. That's what I missed last time. Thank you. And someone else. We have a few more moments. Uh, someone else. Um, and we're going to turn it back over to Dr. Sorge, and he can um, add a little bit more perspective. Do we have questions for him? Okay. Well, I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over. Oh, do we have another? Trishma, do you have another comment? See, how can we replicate this in descriptive exams, like in a way the students write, write text, then the rubric then becomes... Uh, I just want to know the ideas. How can we make for descriptive exams? Thank you. Thank you, Shishma. So, Dr. Sorge, we're going to turn it back over to you. Uh -huh. We're going to invite uh, you to come back into the conversation. Yeah, and I actually would suggest that um, uh, for a traditional writing assignment or the like, uh, now, it's been a long time since I've taken a traditional writing assignment type course, like an English or a history or something like that. But I would guess that uh, all of us through an essay question have some idea in our minds what we would like to see from a particular question, which is why we ask that particular question. Um, and so I, like I said, it's, it's been a while, but I could see if I was teaching uh, more of a writing style class, I have to think about what that would be, then it would be something like uh, five short essays in a two-hour exam kind of course. Uh, it would be a 100-point exam, so each of these uh, essays would be worth 20 points. And, and maybe in my brain, there's 20, it's somewhere between 10 and 20 things that I'm expecting a student to have in there. There might be some default points associated with, you know, is the grammar in general shape? Um, do people know how to use sentence structure? Uh, do people know even what the big overall arching feeling for a particular problem is supposed to be? But then you can actually get into the mechanics of it. Uh, so if it's a history course, were they essentially in the right kind of year to talk about it? Or if it's an American history course, were they you know, motivating it through lecture materials that you actually already had related to uh, American founders and, and whatnot? So, uh, I quickly come up with my brain a, a couple of things that might be useful, as, assign those to a rubric, and then I would have the students submit those, those essays uh, in some particular way. And, and maybe this isn't even a timed exam. Maybe it's deployed over the course of a couple of hours. They can write in their own word processor and, and motivate these things. But inside of SpeedGrader, there are lots of tools to work with text documents as well. You can highlight you can strike out, you can use boxes and lines just like I sort of demonstrated before, and you can highlight you know, where grammar is poor, uh, where one of their motivational points is maybe unmotivated as much as you think, and you can still use a, a pretty representative rubric, I think. Um, now that being said, it, it takes a little bit of art and practice, it's something that I've worked on for 15 or so years and still I'm not necessarily an expert on to get a rubric that works well and is easy to manage, but um, I don't think it's an unsolvable problem. And that being said, I'm not presenter anymore, so I can't build a rubric, but 
um, I could I could give some thoughts for, for what the rubric might look like and how I would possibly build one. Um, and, and we're going to we can go ahead and open. Uh, I can make you presenter once again, Dr. Mm -hmm. Sturgis, so you can do that. We do have a few questions that are coming in from the Davy campus, I believe. Yeah, for whatever reason, they're unable to. So I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, read. Actually, wait a minute. Can somebody unmute Maria? I knew Mary was going to grill me. <laughs> I say it in jest. I work pretty well with Mary. Ashley, can you unmute Maria? She's actually unmuted. Oh, okay. Well, uh, I, can you hear me now? Yes, I we can. Hear now. Okay, so Good. I do have a question for you. Um, so I think that students get to know what they got right, but what kind of opportunity for practice do you provide for the items they miss? Um, even though if it's not to improve the grade, to improve their skills. So that was my question. And also Christina, who was sitting next to me, um, wrote that she thought the rubric was very detailed and that it provides feedback, not only a grade. So uh, right. do you make that also obvious to your students? Like you will get much more from this than the grade. So back to you. Right. <laughs> yeah, so um, uh, thanks for the question. So the, the first thing is um, I do tell the students that there is a fair amount of feedback. Now, they don't necessarily go and, and look for this in order to see necessarily what the feedback is. They want to know what they did right. They want to know what they did wrong. They want to know where they're missing points. And I think what they like best about it is the fact that there's a lot of partial credit and I don't ask them to know how to do everything in order to still do pretty well on these exams. So in general, a student, if they can do two of the three things that I asked them to do, they can do very well. So there's a lot of extra credit built into it. Now, I heard earlier students like to know what they get. Uh, they'll, they'll fight for every point. That's actually what I kind of hear, even though that wording wasn't exactly said. And this actually gives students some way of figuring out where the points disappeared. And if they do come and fight me over these points, I could just say, well, this is how I graded it. Uh, where would you disagree with any of these things? Which is kind of nice. Um, but the first part of your question was, um, uh, where do they get practice for this? So they actually see how to do these problems in a couple of different ways. First of all, I have a number of examples built into all the lecture materials for how I expect them to do representative problems. So problems that they see on exam are representative of things they've already seen. Uh, I might change masses, might change geometry of the problem or something, but it's not intended to be a surprise. They're not trying to trick them. So they see how I approached it in the lecture materials. And in each of the modules, there's a quiz it's entirely built on former exam questions, so whether it's multiple choice, whether it's short answer completion, or these partial credit type problems. They see what they look like and how they're going to be graded. Those types quizzes, so over the course of the whole term, all of the 14 or 15 or so uh, quizzes are worth half of an exam. So, so it's really low stakes. They get to figure out what they know, what they don't know. Uh, how things are going to be graded, how they see feedback, uh, how to really approach the problem and do better in a low stakes environment. And then you know, the students that are paying attention to the low stakes uh, assessments uh, do really well on the exams, and students that pay less attention to the low stakes work don't do as well. Uh, actually, uh, Dr. Summers, could you mute your phone? I might be able to mute it. Oh, I can't. I'm not able to. Do, I think. Yeah. yeah. 
I think you're still a presenter, Lisa. I am. I'm not the host. Mm, that's the issue. That is the issue. Dr. Summers, or, or can somebody? Yeah, there we go. Thank yeah, you. There we go. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. Technology. Yes, gotta love it. Yeah. Anyone else? So I hope that answered your question, Mary. Yeah, it, uh, Mary just responded back that she really likes how you're using those low stake assessments. Okay. Super important. Thank you. And I think that replicates, you know, going back to the real life scenarios. It does replicate real life, um, um, and you know the the students are in the role of the learner, and the feedback is um, that real time feedback and uh, right on the document. I think is key. And um, you, uh, Dr. Sorge, you may have mentioned this before. Um, I was getting a lot of feedback, and I wasn't really hear, hearing all of what you were saying just a few moments ago. But um, you and I had talked about um, that students previous to the you know your um, use of speed grader and, and feedback right on the documents and so on oftentimes they wouldn't even they wouldn't even see the feedback at the end of, of some summative assessments they wouldn't go back and, and get the documents and you'd have them no. just there and they would never get it yeah I've, I've got stacks of exams in my office stacks of old exams that, that uh, students wouldn't come and get. Uh, at the end of a typical semester for an introductory course like this, I could easily fill up a whole box for printer paper. You know, the kind of printer paper that holds many, many reams of, of uh, printer paper. And I, the, the leftover stuff at the end of the term that I put into archives would fill that box. Those are the students that don't get any feedback at all, have no idea what's going on. No idea, no idea. No well, you've definitely, you've definitely given us some, some things to consider, and you have presented different opportunities for people to uh, try something that they feel comfortable with. It's not an all or nothing that you're presenting to us here. It's what, what are the individual comfort levels? What am I comfortable with trying? What can I try in the fall with my, with my course coming in? my students coming in what can i try right away that um you know that maybe doesn't intimidate me or you know i can sort of figure out easily i mean I, you, you presented us with varying levels of that type of experience so i want to thank you for that and one final note uh, canvas has a lot of nice tools for playing around so say you were to uh, develop an exam very similar to this and uh, you want to just play around with how you might grade it with a rubric. It, it turns out that you can just mute the stuff that you're grading. Uh, or now they use it uh, hide because they just changed the terminology a week ago. So you hide it and maybe build a rubric, uh, assign the rubric to this particular problem and, and play around with, how, well, how would this rubric work if I wanted to grade this assignment? And if you don't like it, that's fine. Uh, if you want a rubric that the students don't see that you still want to have it associated with, there's a checkbox that lets it be hidden to the students and only you see how it was graded. If you want to just kind of play around and see how it would work, there's, there's nothing about that. And once you're in a place where you're happy, then of course you publish your results. But uh, you can actually play around with it without doing anything permanent if you want to just kind of see how it works. Well, thank you for that. That's, that's important to know as well. Yeah, I, we can't break the stuff. It doesn't yeah. work. <laughs> and lots of times where I'll get halfway through a, a problem that I'm grading and I'm like, man, a lot of students are making the same silly mistake. And that might have been a failing on my part. So then I can go back and give a couple of points back here and there, grade it in a different way. And students don't know any different until I publish it. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, because how would they otherwise? Exactly. Yeah. So I want to thank you for this, Dr. Sorge. Um, um, Mary uh, just chimed in and said that... Um, your presentation today was fantastic. Oh, well, thank you. And, and I agree. And she um, would know her presentation a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> and, I, and I will jump in with that as well. Uh, thank you both for doing such a good job. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and, and Lisa did all the work. Uh, all I had to do is present a little bit of stuff. But uh, thank, I would also like to thank you, Lisa.
No, thank you. I appreciate that. So, folks, this is the first go that we've had with this type of a format, a success analysis. We're hoping to try more of um, exactly what we, we had here today. It's important that we put you folks at the center of what we do with professional development. Your stories are very important. So if you are interested in joining one of us, if you're interested in sharing a little bit of your experience with colleagues from around the university, please reach out to us and let us know. Uh, we have other formats that we can use. It doesn't have to be a success analysis. We have a challenge analysis where you have a challenge or you have some sort of an obstacle and you want to present your challenge to your colleagues and ask for their advice. How would they go about solving this obstacle that continues to get in your way and the way of your students? So we, we have others like that, other types of uh, formats that we would love to use. And again, put you at the center of the conversation. And with that, we're, we're two minutes beyond one o'clock. So I want to go ahead and, and end this presentation today. Once again, I want to thank uh, Dr. Corey Sorge for joining us. I'd like to thank the Center for E-Learning for hosting. Ashley, well done once again. Thank you, Dr. Thank Summers, you. And for all the folks over at Davey and anyone who's over at um, over in Boca, thank you for joining us, everyone. We appreciate your time. Thanks for sharing it with us. And that being said, we're going to end the presentation for today. I do hope you enjoy the rest of your week. Bye for now. Take care, folks. Thank you so much. Thank you again.